My name is Václav Brezina. I'm a researcher at the uh, CAS Research Center at Lancaster University and it is my great pleasure to have Detmar Mayores from the University of Tübingen here, Professor of Computational Linguistics. And we'll be talking about his research, his research background and things he's uh, interested in in the, in the, in the field. Uh, Detmar, when I look at your website there's a very interesting range of exciting research interests. How would you describe yourself as a researcher and what is your research background? Thanks, that's a complex question because when I studied actually, um, that was yeah, in the early N 80s, early 90s, um, there was no computational linguistics as a field um, yet clearly delineated. So I studied linguistics, psychology and computer science. Mm. And um, in a sense all of these different strands keep coming back and some fade, more other areas come in. And then for my dissertation, that was still kind of with grammar, theoretical linguistics, but then corpora. How can I use corpora to find these kind of um, examples illustrating and also showing us more about parameters, properties of um, different constructions we are interested in. And so in a sense, then I moved to the US, um, was an assistant professor at Ohio State University, and there I was hired as a computational linguist. And then suddenly you find yourself with a particular label, and before it was more kind of a little of work on syntax, um, as I said, with corpora. But then um, the, suddenly you have to teach and you also want to teach courses in your area because that was now an area with Chris Brew. Uh, we were building up the company program at Ohio State University in a linguistics department that has a wide range of topics from social linguistics, contact linguistics, speech, Mary Beckman and people, to um, kind of then formal um, theoretical linguistics, um, David Dowdy, Carl Pollard, HBSG, then down to kind of um, computational linguistics, which in a sense tries to connect to these different areas. You can do speech corpora, you can do work on, I start to get interested in language learners, um, you can do intelligent tutoring systems, collect data that way. And then for teaching there, I had to teach more air, um, courses um, that were targeted towards um, computational linguistics. And, uh, but it was always one area in a large linguistics department. I think we were 15 faculty members, oh, wow. which for a linguistics department Quite is a large one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then the idea is that if you have students who kind of on the one hand want to specialize in an area, so it's a PhD program, five years, and you basically, you have some people who want to get into it, and then you need to prepare them enough so that they can actually, you know, read the current research and contribute to the current research themselves in a couple of years. And you also want to provide some kind of breadth so that people can see, you know, what kind of methods are there. And uh, so in a sense that shaped my thinking um, because uh, Chris Brew, Marcus Dickinson, former PhD student of mine and um, was now at UI Bloomington, just got tenure, I'm very proud. Wow. Um, <laughs> and uh, he um, and Chris and I, we then sat down and asked ourselves, what can we do to bridge that gap between where people are and what they want to get into, the methods you have there, but also addressing their questions. And uh, while we normally worked a lot on, um, on the PhD level, um, because we had to bring up the new, um, what was called the, the strand in um, the PhD program, we um, also wanted to kind of bridge that gap from what people are interested in and what computational linguistics has to offer. And then we uh, did a course called Language and Computers, hmm. which um, basically asks people, what is your daily experience with technology? For example, you get an email, has question marks in it, lots of them. You wonder, hmm, why do people send messages with question marks? And you find out, well, how about character sets? How do you encode Chinese? Mm. How do you encode Arabic? What happens when you send a German uh, message with ü, umlaut, and then why is there sometimes a question mark? Well, it has to do with character encoding. And then you go to email again and ask yourself, what happens when I press advertising? This is advertising or this is spam. And the, the idea is, well, you're training a machine learner, it's statistical, drawing some inferences, but it's not recognizing that every time I say Viagra or something, it's not, I send you a message and say, hey, Vatslav, um, I'm really tired of all these messages with Viagra in it. We need to do something about our email uh, filtering. Yeah, and, and then, it would immediately get spam filtered if, if, if we yeah, are not careful. Exactly, mm -hmm. and the question is, why mm -hmm. do, uh, does it not happen that um, kind of mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. technology has advanced beyond mm -hmm. just recognizing a single Viagra mm -hmm. as a, this marks it as, um, as spam? And then you ask yourself, oh, you need to go deeper into language. Mm. And uh, so and then we do dialogue systems and machine translation. And we basically always say, what's your experience with calling up a dialogue system? What is a dialogue anyways? And um, what is, for example, when you go to Google and you search a web page, does it show you the web pages at a certain level of readability? Mm. Or does it just show you the ones at the right content that you're interested in, with the right content you're interested in? And so we always take people from their experience and then pull them into what are the methods, how does it work? 
and um, the in a sense that has shaped my thinking even further in this now if people ask me you know what do you do I just say linguistic modeling trying uh -huh. to figure out how language works um, which aspects of language matter where and then going into um, trying to kind of connect contexts in which we use language with function and meaning and the forms hmm. kind of yeah, categories and forms that we have and to see where where it matters for it doesn't have to be applications but also just deepen our understanding of um, the use of language and, um, and then you can see in a sense now uh, I'm back in tubing which mm. was somewhat of an accident but after eight years of Bush it was also like you look abroad again you uh -huh. see um, what do you do what's what's happening in Europe is there a position there and so I moved back to Germany mm. and um, the also closer to my parents it, it helps kind of research is important but family is too mm. and um, then um, kind of coming back to to Germany now I'm in the Department of Linguistics again mm which in Germany is also quite rare, usually people are in the, say, English or yeah. in the and Anglistic and, and, yeah. and, 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 and Anglistic, mm. Germanistic, Germanistic, exactly. Yeah. And then the idea is that in that um, department now we have a degree program in computational linguistics, mm. but we also have people who come in and do, say, cognitive science or uh, they study um, yeah, English, for example. So quite a and multidisciplinary... Exactly. Yeah. And we have a, a new... Now the empirical educational research mm. is also has set up shop and we have a new graduate school in empirical educational research called LEAD. Um, and uh, that is now trying to also connect the contents of teaching with the methods to the research into the effectiveness of teaching and that has supported of course more the side of getting into language learning. So you were talking about language modeling as the sort of uh, common uh, threat to all your, your research, you know, all different applications of your research. And we were talking about computational science as a sort of emerging uh, discipline, a sort of relatively new, new discipline called, compared to linguistics or other social science uh, disciplines. Would you, for the benefit of our viewers, uh, would you tell us a bit more about computational linguistics as mm -hmm. a discipline, as a field? Yeah. Um, the amazing thing is that it really has changed a lot in the last 20 years. So I've been basically, I finished my first, so my master's degree in 1994, and then 1995, for example, ACL, that's the big annual conference, everyone, where everyone basically goes. And at the time that was MIT, and there were, I think, say 300, 400 people there in total of the entire world basically doing computational linguistics, and there were a single, a single session, everyone there, everyone was listening to it, and everyone was sharing, in a sense, a similar background, which at the time included some theoretical linguistics, some um, strong AI kind of um, basically theory-driven theory modeling of what language is, and very few applications. At the time, you have to think back, there was no, I mean, there wasn't internet, but it wasn't, people didn't have ready access to web pages, um, email, you know, I still remember walking through tubing, and there was um, someone there and they said, I now have an email address. And I said, so what are you going to do? Like, read it every day to find that no one, your grandmother is not going to write <laughs> right, you. Yes, know? Yes, yes. But now, of course, everyone has email. So that everyone was 1994? That was mid -90s. That the mid-90s. And so the mid-90s, so my first contact with kind of internet was, I was an exchange student Erasmus, which mm. I can highly recommend to everyone. <laughs> because it really, I went to Toulouse, a computer science department, um, uh, and uh, Paul Sabatier, um, where people suddenly kind of at the transition from masters to um, PhD, I was, I was a master's student then, um, they gave us internet access. So we had email accounts, but at that, in those days, you know, then I came back to tubing and um, then we, um, people were saying that they're starting search engines on the web and I said, why? I know all the web pages. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, why would you <laughs> want to search if you, you just go to the page and then there you, you are. know the web page, you, know you the go there. And, yeah. and, and it was primarily for mm. exchanging research papers. Mm. And then, um, kind of, it really transitioned mm. to more and more people got into it because suddenly there were applications. Everyone, when I studied, it was like machine translation. Well, it doesn't work. We do other uh, other things. And now, with the internet, suddenly, if you have a web page that's in Chinese, it really makes a big difference whether you can at, at all access it. And then the exact quality of the translation isn't the key element anymore. Mm. And suddenly, all these applications from translation to um, search um, to uh, classification. You have lots of text and you want to put them into boxes and by, by topics, for example. And there were um, discussion threads. How do you organize uh, threads in a discussion? And all this text became available, all these um, different users making use of the internet. And then that really changed um, the game hmm. in computational linguistics because sentiment analysis. How do you figure out about which topics people are talking in a positive way, negative way? You have a company and you ask yourself, 
I have a new model. I wonder what they talk about out there in all their chats and all their uh, tweets. And, and then you, you, you can't read you know, 30,000 messages. Mm. So what you do is you ask people to kind of figure out which kind of topics, which type of parts of your car or whatever, um, people are characterizing in a positive way, negative way, and then you figure out how you change your advertising campaign or whatever. And the idea then is, um, in computational linguistics, people suddenly had lots of low-hanging fruit. Um, namely, well, if you can't do it at all with 30,000 messages, can we at least do it a bit better with um, some technology? Mm -hmm. And uh, that really decreased the interest in language as such mm -hmm. and increased the interest in what can we do with the resources we have out there. So technology and... Technology and, and applications. Mm -hmm. And together with it, um, what happened was that uh, people really had... Um, Theory is great, you can, in a sense you can see the future, but a lot of the things right in front of you, you stumble over because it's not that kind of in language what it corresponds to is we can characterize specific problems. Uh, one particular area in linguistics is long distance dependencies. Mm -hmm. So normally words are together if they're interpreted together. It's easy. I mean, why would you do it elsewhere? You know, John kicked um, you know, the chair, uh, then obviously the kicking has something to do with the chair and John because it's organized next to each other and so it's interpreted mm -hmm. together. But if I tell you something like, John is the kind of guy that Mary always told me Paul likes. Hmm. Um, you, you understand it without any problems. But so I was able to extract this John hmm. far away from likes. It's interpreted hmm. together with, you know, it's the object of likes. Hmm. And so there's a lot of theoretical interest in when can you pull things away from where they are interpreted, uh, so-called long-distance dependencies. And there was a lot of research in it, but then if you focus on that, there's a lot of language out there that, you, that doesn't fall into that kind of domain that's of particular theoretical interest. And suddenly in Compling, um, the, the shift um, happened from let's think about the hard cases and the theoretically interesting ones to let's think about those cases which are actually out there, partly because of applications, but partly also of a shift going from theory to more data-driven research. And in computational linguistics, that coincided with the availability of lots of corpora. So you had um, data that was annotated with linguistic insights, you know, parts of speech and things. And then if you ask yourself parts of speech, you know, on the one hand, you could characterize what's a verb, and we can talk about inflection, you can talk about typical denotations, what is typical semantics of a verb, typical positions in a sentence. Instead, you could also say, hey, here is 30,000 words annotated with, um, with parts of speech, figure it out yourself. And kind of what linguists then did, they annotated properties, and these properties were no longer kind of the intention, kind of the what does it mean was no longer the center of attention, but the extension, the uh, show me some examples. And then, in Compling, that meant we need to shift to a mode from encoding rules, generalizations, to um, learning from data. And suddenly machine learning, statistical methods um, became very popular. And then for about 10 years, um, people really looked at not the question of what does it mean, but the question of, if you give me data, can I learn from that data, what the annotations that people provided, what they mean, and then apply to new data, and kind of to other domains, domain adaptation. So would it be fair to say that it is a sort of data-driven uh, discipline that sort of uses computers to make sense of the large amounts of data that are now available mm -hmm. with the rise of the internet and other technologies? Yeah, yeah nowadays that's a good characterization, but uh, nowadays, so for a while, people then um, kind of had shifted entirely from what have we learned about language and linguistics, thousands of years of study in a sense about language, to uh, let's look at data. And then there's one big problem with data. Data in a sense, if you look at, if you think about corpora, then they record the past. They record mm -hmm. what people have said before. So in a sense, what you try to do by learning is you try to say, well, how often is the future like the past? And it very often is the case that the future is like the past. I mean, the kind of weather we have today, you know, if you did weather forecasting based on past weathers, then you will probably find days that are quite similar to today. And then you look at, well, what were the conditions back then? And you can learn and just... Rain is always default here. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's what we call them the majority baseline. That's kind of always, you need to make sure that when you report your results, you don't report it against, uh, you know, well, look, I can do the 60% of the time, but mm. then if the majority baseline, the case, that's most often the case, mm. is 70, you're not doing very well. Mm. But, <coughs> so what came back then is if you want to go beyond kind of the past, if you want to go beyond predicting based on my past experience, this is what is the case right now, um, and very often the future replicates the past, but not always. So in a sense then my saying is always linguists can see the future, linguists know the system mm. and can predict based on what they understand 
about how language works, what could also happen even though you don't have a record of that in your corpus. Mm. So now you're basically then full circle. You come from theory, how does language work, to data, show me lots of examples, and then you can predict from those examples for new examples, but you ask yourself, have I covered the full domain? And the answer is, well, every corpus will only cover part of the domain. So you need more corpora, louder corpora, more representative corpora, but you also need some insight about kind of what, how does language as a system constrain the possibility of what happens in corpora. And then that's where computational linguistics now in a sense is, that um, it has shifted from easily observable forms to also meanings and discourse, where of course it's much less constrained by the forms. And therefore, kind of when you talk about uh, meaning, um, for example, now very popular distributional semantics. So, meaning of words inferred by their use in context, first kind of idea. And now you ask yourself, what can I do in this kind of bottom-up way? And then how can I get to the kind of top-down what I know it means and the function of things uh, in language and discourse? And there you need some more top-down element, mm -hmm. knowledge about language and discourse, formal pragmatics, information mm -hmm. structure, things like that. And um, you, you look for the uh, happy marriage of data-driven um, approaches and top-down constraints. Right. In a sense, that's where coupling is, to get together with the applications. The applications, of course, have their own domain now. Um, in LRAC, a big conference um, about applications also, there is a thousand accepted abstracts. Um, accepted abstract, so lots of parallel Amazing. sessions. So we're, we've moved quite a ways from... Because you mentioned that when, when the field yeah. started, it was a very sort of uh, small group of people doing actually computation and linguistics, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and the early conferences were just a few and people. Exactly, and now it's, um, it's kind of, yeah, thousands, and the question is what is still the common ground? So I think the common ground has a bit been lost, um, and uh, that's why it's great to have kind of here now, in a sense, this kind of series, where you're building up again kind of what, do, what is, are the methods and background in corpora and in coupling, um, Dan Drafsky and um, Drafsky and Martin is a book that also kind of sums things up or kind of when we do the language and computers book with Chris Brew and uh, Marcus Dickinson where we again try to kind of bring people, give them a link so that you can still buy into kind of what are the methods, what are the applications without having studied it where everyone has the same background because that doesn't exist anymore. There isn't a single canon of you have to know this and everyone knows what an unbound dependency construction is. If you nowadays went to ACL and said unbound dependency construction, I bet you know half the people would say, what's this guy talking about? We're here doing phrase-based statistical machine translation and, and it's gotten so specialized. So it's the usual development it's, of any scientific yeah. field. It becomes compartmentalized, compartmentalized. specialized.